Genesis chapter 4. It's our pleasure to have with us Tim and Barb Watley last week. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, really appreciate all the investment and involvement so many of you put into that uh, kickoff Sunday event that we had. We had a couple of people who had come to check us out during that time. Uh, Lord willing, we'll try to do that similar emphasis next year so we can be learning from some of the things that we were able to incorporate this year. And uh, I get to get a Patriots jersey in there some year. <laughs> but we'll, we'll see what happens there. Uh, but we do really appreciate the way that you've gotten invested, gotten involved. Uh, remember to be inviting not just people to special events like that, but look for opportunities uh, to share the hope of Christ with others. And, and these events are not going to be the, the key to all of our evangelistic efforts, but we certainly hope and pray uh, that the Lord will use things like this, use things like we just had with the kickoff Sunday, use the, the fire and feast, use the, uh, the light up the night kinds of activities to give you an opportunity to bring in others uh, to meet people who are believers in Christ, and to hear uh, the gospel that can change their life. We truly believe that uh, here at Calvary Baptist Church. I hope you personally believe that. Not just give it lip service, but if you believe that the gospel is capable of changing lives, you also believe that a light needs to be seen in order to be useful. A light needs to be shared, uh, and that we will try to be praying and looking for opportunities where each of us uh, can have that opportunity to share the hope that we have because of Jesus Christ. We're in Genesis chapter 4. I've entitled the message this morning, Crime and Punishment. There is an outline on the back of your worship guide if you'd like to use that to follow along here with us this morning. We'll be focusing uh, here in verse 11 in just a moment. Why is 12 an unfair number? Because it's two against one. Stop and think about that for a minute. It's totally unfair. I just got kicked out of my coffee club. The reason they gave is because I was wearing a T-shirt. A T-shirt. <laughs> Again, maybe you have to think about those two just a minute. Maybe you have, and that explains the, 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 the dour look on your face, Pastor. It's not that funny. <laughs> that's just not fair that you're not laughing. <laughs> but that's kind of the attitude that we can have sometimes, not necessarily about humor, but the idea that there's conflict, and we have conflict, you know, maybe it's because my kids, they get called on something they should have done, and they didn't do, they failed to do it, and so mom and dad implement a consequence, and that consequence is hard, and it's not so much that our children would say, I, you're, this is an unjust, it's not deserved, they say, no, I, I realize I've done wrong, but the punishment is, to quote the text we're just going to read from, is greater than I can bear. Uh, it just doesn't feel fair. It doesn't, the punishment doesn't seem to fit the crime, as it were. On the other hand, you look at, maybe mom is looking here and says, you've had all day, all week to do these things. I don't know how else to get through to you. It's an inconvenience for you just to, to have these privileges removed, but now we're having to take all of the extra time that you should have gotten these things done, and you've eaten into my evening. You've eaten into it, 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 taking away from other things that I need to do. It doesn't really line up. I think this is a very light punishment given all the consequences that you've put upon me. And again, parents can kind of talk through that, and you can reason that yes, sometimes what hurts the, ch the child, what hurts the one getting the consequence, also means consequences for the one who is giving that. But it's also an opportunity to weigh out things like justice and mercy, on the other hand. Because yes, you do need to help the pro child understand the, the, the process of discipline, but you also don't want to punish them so hard that they never get the opportunity to understand grace. You hear the protests, but you also see that there's something that you need to shape and mold in that child's heart. But oftentimes, the guilty party, whether we're talking children whose attitudes and spirituality still need to be molded, 
or we're talking the hardened criminal who is absorbing all these things, who hasn't learned his or her lesson, who continues to repeat these kinds of behaviors, they will often say, I don't deserve this. And there's a, there's a lack of acknowledgement. There's a lack of responsibility. You see that certainly in how Cain communicates to God. And let's look at the text just so we can get the context of that this morning. Genesis chapter 4, beginning with verse 11. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. God has just confronted Cain, as we've looked at a couple of weeks ago now, uh, actually about three weeks ago, with the murder of his brother. And now he's giving the sentencing, picking up in verse 11. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer get yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be as a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then, the Lord, or then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. This is the word of God, inerrant, infallible, inspired, written by God and written for us that we might know what to believe, that we might know how to live, and that on its pages we might meet the living Christ. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Before we get into the outline, just a few remarks. There are different things that we could talk about here. One of them, uh, which is not really going to figure too much prominently into our application, but there's been a lot of speculation on it, is found in verse 15, where it says, The Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. There's been a lot of speculation as to what that mark was. Some have said maybe, well, see, God gave the first tattoo. I, I don't know if that's what it was or not. Uh, it certainly was not a mark of shame on one hand. After all, why does God say that he is so that nobody would kill him? It was a mark to protect him, to single him out. Some have, though, I think wrongfully speculated over time that maybe it was something like uh, one of the popular prevailing theories out there over the course of human civilization has been it was for dark skin. And they use that kind of reasoning to justify how one human being might mistreat another and used it to justify institutions like slavery. What I want to put to rest here right now is absolute, whatever else it was, which we do not know what it was, it absolutely was not that. It absolutely was not that. What we see here, on the other hand, is that God delights in mercy. Even to somebody who is hardened and rebellion, there is never any reason to justify the mistreatment, the mischaracterization, the dehumanizing of one ethnicity, one people group over the other, especially, friends, when it comes to something like skin color. That is not what this is. is. This is not what the Bible is describing, and I want to make sure that we say that very clearly as we get in. That's, again, that's not the point of the passage here, but that is the misapplication of this passage that has been done historically, and that is definitely not what is happening here in this passage. What, again, I do want to emphasize here, though, and I think we can see this from the outline if you're using that on the back of your worship guide, is that what we see in this passage is that God reveals himself as being a God of mercy. God is merciful. How does he demonstrate that mercy, that withholding of the consequences that Cain certainly deserved for his actions? I would, I would submit to you that he is delaying justice. He understands that Cain has committed a grievous sin. Right from the beginning, we see here that even though 
specific written commandments haven't been established. That's going to happen much later, several hundreds of years later. And we're going to see that in the next book, Exodus chapter 20, when God gives Moses the, the Ten Commandments. He writes these laws with his own figure on tablets of finger, with, on tablets of stone. And what is one of the, the first ones that he gives there in that ten? After he says, you will not have any other gods before me, and he gives all the, the, the instructions for his relationship with humanity, how God, humanity relates to God. When humanity relates to others, the first one he says is, you will not kill. Thou shalt not kill. We might have learned it in the King James, but it's not saying that you never ever can take a life. There are reasons to take a life, but we could interpret that more clearly in our vernacular as do not murder. Do not take that privilege into your own hands. Cain, obviously here from the text, did that. He rose up and slew his brother. John will talk about this, recording the words of Jesus later in his gospel, uh, and, and says, why did, did Cain do that? Because Abel and his works were righteous, and Cain had his conscience smitten against him. Cain was convicted of his own pride, of his own failures, his own shortcomings, resented Abel, and took out his anger and his frustration in his brother in an extreme way. God understood that a sin, a grievous act of hatred and rebellion had been committed, and yet he does not implement the death penalty. In fact, we would also make an observation here. Shall his blood be shed? For God made man in his own image. It is establishing the authority of human government, taking directly out of the administration of God. In fact, he will say that later on when he's giving more of the details of the law, not just the Ten Commandments, don't murder, but he gives instructions in Numbers 35, 16, that the murderer, the consequences for that act, shall be put to death. So there is the idea of capital punishment being within the mindset and with the character of God. And yet, friends, that's something we can learn from here, because what does he do? He does not execute Cain. Instead, he says, now you are cursed from the ground. Interesting fact here as well. Even though God has cursed the creation because of Adam and Eve and their sin, even though God has placed hardship on Eve in childbearing, it's interesting to note this is the first time God curses a human being. This is the first time a human being has a curse pronounced upon him. You say, well, wait a minute. Well, just examine. He curses the serpent in verse 14 of chapter 3, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock. And he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. But to the woman, he says, I will multiply your pain in childbearing. But that's not, this is important for us to note, that's not really a curse. Childbearing, bringing children into the world, is a blessing, right? Children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. And part of the reason we see such problems in our society, in homes and families, part of the reason as we look at an election cycle and we see people again talking about abortion and having all these these, these combats and debates about it is because people don't always believe that, isn't it? Children are something that are going to weigh me down. They're going to cramp my style. They're going to uh, slow down the progress up the chain. They're not going to allow me to develop the resources to live the kind of lifestyle. I they're, they're an inconvenience. And friends, whatever else we might say about wisdom and planning and resources and careers and things, I, I would submit to you that much of our problem would be solved, as Dr. Clay mentioned again during the Sunday school hour this morning. This is a hard issue. This is a hard issue, and it comes down to scorning and scoffing at the good gifts God has given to us, like children, 
It comes down to seeing sexuality not as something to be given as the benefit of humanity, but it's more of a diversion. It's more entertainment. It's more pleasure. It's more of a, of a thing that we can do for recreation. And not God's plan to give life, to give stability in society. And that's really what it's all about. The whole abortion debate comes with the devaluing of human life and the selfishness of our own hearts. We want the freedom to be able to do with our bodies whatever it is we want to do. And we don't love each other as we should. We don't think of others before ourselves. We don't think about the care that we should give for those who aren't capable of caring for themselves. And friends, whatever else, the Christian way is not necessarily synonymous with one political party. But the Christian mindset ought to be that we love our neighbor as ourselves. We care for others. We do not murder. And we watch out for those who cannot defend themselves. Consider that even as you weigh out some of the decisions that might lie in front of you. But at the same time, here for the context of what God does with Cain, it is not implementing the death penalty. Instead, he curses Cain from the ground. Now, when God cursed creation in chapter 3, picking up in chapter 3 and verse 17, God says to Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. He doesn't say, Adam, you are cursed. But what does he do? Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So, he doesn't curse Adam, rather he curses the ground. The ground is going to be productive, but it's also going to be working against you. It's not going to be easy. He makes it more complicated for Cain, on the other hand. Now, verse 11 of chapter 4, you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, verse 12, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. So, as we see later on, he will go to be more of a wanderer, a vagabond, uh, a nomad, but he's also not capable of really being in agriculture at this stage of the game. He's probably going to have give more of his energies to building cities, building civilizations, doing other things that would go against the plan that God had initially for humanity. He is seen at the beginning of chapter 4 as a gift to Adam and Eve. Eve says, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And she's talking about Cain. He does not prove to be everything that his potential would seem. And yet, we don't take away from the fact that yes, he was still a gift of God's good providence. God provided them with hope. Hope that maybe didn't come to fruition. But ladies and gentlemen, friends and neighbors, what we tell you here is that every child has that potential. But as we mature as we grow. We are each of us responsible for what we're going to do with that potential. The, ch the Christian parent has been given the responsibility. How do we raise those children? In the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Paul, uh, uh, Moses would tell, uh, speaking for God, to the Israelites, you talk about God's truths. When you lie down, when you rise up, you speak of them when you are going uh, into, into the house and when you're going out. You have these 
things pounded down. They are an integral part of your life. You teach them to love the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, with all their strength. But you have no guarantee that they are going to hold on to it once they leave. You do everything you can to give them that influence. But what we do with it, what Cain did with it here, was not in Adam and Eve's control. But even here, withholding the consequences, the certainty of the death penalty, God was giving Cain the opportunity, it does, one he doesn't seem like he took, to, to allow for repentance. To acknowledge what he had done. This grievous sin in the sight of God and in the sight, as it were, of society. As few as they might have been during that time, there was uh, certainly not just harshness, but horror that must have been unleashed. How could you do this grievous act? And yet, we see no remorse indicated on Cain's part. He does not say, I'm overwhelmed with guilt. Uh, my conscience is, is just heavy within me. He says, my punishment, verse 13, is greater than I can bear. You have driven me today away from the ground, pointing at God, as it were, in verse 14. And from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. He's complaining. When God is really giving him the opportunity to repent. And yet, this is not unique with Cain. He might have been one of the first to be recorded to do it. And yet, again... Whether you're a child saying, that's not fair uh, when a parent gives out a, a punishment or a consequence, or whether it's people who are recorded in Revelation chapter 16 as God is pouring out his wrath in John's prophecy and what's going to happen on the world. In Revelation 16 verse 10, people nod their tongues in anguish, but what do they do as God is judging them for their sin? Verse 11, they curse the God of heaven for their pain and sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. God is confronting them, laying out the consequences for their sin, and it's not driving them to repentance. It's driving them to anger and resentment. When Jesus hung on the cross, what does it say about the two men who stood on either side of him, who hung there on their crosses? It says in Matthew 27, 44, the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him, just like the crowd is mocking him. They aren't overwhelmed by their own crimes. They're just heaping scorn and contempt, even as they suffer for their own sins. But then later on, Luke records this. His conscience, at least one of them, got a hold of him. The other's mocking, but this one says, Do you not fear God? To his fellow, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. In other words, we have what's coming to us. We have done wrong, and we are being punished, and it's justice is being done. But, the thief says, this man pointing, as it were, at Jesus, though he couldn't really point because his hands were bound as well, but this man has done nothing wrong. And here we see the indication of what this man's repentance looked like. He doesn't say, I'm sorry, but he acknowledges that he was wrong. And he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he acknowledges, I have done wrong. I need your forgiveness. I need Lord, what you and you only can supply. Cain had the opportunity, friends, and didn't take it. God showed his mercy and patience with Cain. How will you respond? How should we respond? The thief on the cross gives us that indication of what that should look like. And it reminds us here as we look at this text this morning, friends, do not be a victim. Do not be the person who says it's not fair 
that I don't deserve this, that society is being hard on me, they don't understand my upbringing, they don't understand my handicaps, they, and we can point fingers at so many different things. I have an addiction. I have this condition. I, I've been trained. My, my body has been trained. I have these impulses. I don't even want to deny the reality that there are some people who struggle with different sins. Temptations look differently for different people. All we have to do is look at society and understand not everybody is dealt the same deck of, uh, hand of cards in life as the other person. Each one of us are varied. Each one of us has struggles and difficulties to overcome. But we also must remember what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians, that no temptation has taken you, but such as is common to man. In other words, humanity, we might, I might struggle with something differently than Henry up here or Sam. But that doesn't mean that that excuses our poor choices. God is faithful and will, with the temptation, the Apostle Paul says, also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. That temptation may be real, but there's always a means to escape. You say, well, you don't understand, Pastor. My, my, my therapist has given me a diagnosis. I have an addiction. I do these things because I can't help it. Scripture would say otherwise. Scripture would say there's always a way to say no. Doesn't mean it won't be hard. Doesn't mean it's not, there, there's, there's not things that make it maybe easier for somebody to lose their temper than another person, or that somebody doesn't struggle with the addictive effects of alcohol more than another and that, that temptation might look different for you than another person. But there's never no other choice than I get a drink. Or I've got to go out and express myself sexually. I've got to do this. I've got to, you know, I, I wouldn't have lost my cool if you had, no, that's on you. That person maybe could have done something differently not to provoke you. But you have control over whether or not you allow yourself to be provoked. And maybe that's harder for you than another person. But God still calls us to holiness. God still tells everybody, not just the people who it's really easy for, to be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Which, which, by the way, that last part is saying, if you do lose your temper, if you do lose your cool, don't let it stay there. Don't let anger and bitterness and resentment build up. Instead, resolve the relationship. Come together. Acknowledge your accountability, your responsibility there, but also look to reinstate that relationship with somebody else. That's really what about confession and acknowledgement is. What can I do? So the psalmist says in Psalm 32, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. He's talking there in the context of how we resolve that with God, which is something Cain really ought to have done, and we never have a record that he did. It's something that each one of us needs to do as well. David says after his sin with Bathsheba, against you and you alone to God have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. He needed to repair that relationship with God. But also, we are told in the New Testament that we as Christians, one of the clear things that we ought to do is not just make our relationship with God clear, but Ephesians 4, after it says, be angry and do not sin. Put away lying. Let him who stole steal no longer, but labor. Replace those things. How does it conclude? Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. And why? What's the reasoning? Even as God, 
for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. In other words, keep those relationships clear. Don't allow bitterness and resentment and grudges to be the dominant force in your relationships. Make things short. Keep those relationships open and comfortable. Don't allow yourself to harbor resentment inside. Hold things for days, weeks, months, years. So you can't even look at the person on the other side of the auditorium because of what they did to you. Or you can't show up at a family reunion because she knows what she did. And you don't even want to deal with that. Friend, that's on you. To keep that relationship open. Reinstate it. What Cain could have done is not been the fugitive and the wanderer. Cain could have pled to God for mercy, but he didn't. What we need to do is to look to God and like, not make the mistake of Cain or the Jews when Jesus came. It says in John chapter 1 that Jesus was in the world. The world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. Jesus came to his own people, and his own people, the Jews, did not receive him, but to all of us who did receive him, who believed in his name. We are no longer enemies. He has given us the right to be called children, to be called sons of God when we have faith in him. He will restore. He will forgive. Our God will abundantly pardon. Friends, Cain was committed to a life of wandering and isolation apart from God. The thing I want you to remember as you look at his example and learn how you can learn from his mistakes as well as make better choices, you need to stop wandering and start worshiping. You need to acknowledge God for being the God of mercy, the God of forgiveness, the God of pardon. And allow yourself to realize, yes, I have done wrong. It's nobody else's fault. It's me. And I, God, I need your forgiveness. Powerful illustration that I think you will agree with me as we bring this message to a close this morning. Many of you know the story of Corey Ten Boom. Maybe you read her biography, The Hiding Place, that details her life during World War II in Germany when the Nazis were persecuting and exterminating the Jews and her father and family harbored so many of these people who were, whose lives were in danger. They were going to be executed for no other crime than the color of their skin, as it were, than their ethnicity. And as they helped these people escape and they hid them, they were eventually caught and Corey and her sister Betsy were sent to a concentration camp where Corey's sister later died. The cruelty they endured there was beyond words. Reading this anecdote, it says, After the war, Corey became a speaker and shared her experiences, preaching about forgiveness and God's grace. One day after speaking at a church in Germany, she was approached by a man who introduced himself as one of the guards from the concentration camp where Corey and Betsy had been held in where her sister had died. And he told her that he had become a Christian. And he asked for her forgiveness. Corey was frozen. Though she had just spoken about forgiveness, she found it hard to extend grace to this man who had caused her so much suffering. At that moment, she felt that forgiving him would be an unfair punishment for all that he and others had done to her and her sister. The pain was too fresh. If the story ended there, probably many of us could sympathize with her. We would understand. Yes, there are things that just are impossible to be forgiven. There are crimes that are just too harsh for humanity to overcome. We can understand. We could sympathize. We keep reading. It says, The man, on the other hand, did not feel his punishment had been harsh enough. Though he sought for forgiveness, he knew that no punishment could undo the atrocities he had committed or erase the suffering of his victims. 
he recognized that the weight of his guilt, but now as a Christian, he still looked for grace. Corey prayed for strength, and after a moment, she extended her hand to him, offering the forgiveness that was so hard to give. She later wrote about how in that act, she felt the overwhelming love of God flow through her, realizing that true forgiveness goes beyond what we think is fair. And it's an act of grace that is empowered by God. Friend, where your sin abounds, God's mercy abounds more. Cain did never, from all we can see that Moses recorded, never really came to that understanding. He could only see how he was inconvenienced, how it wasn't fair, how it was more than he could bear. But God extends His grace even to the thief on the cross. When there is no time left for that man to reform and make up for all the bad things that he had ever done, really it was, there was nothing he could do but plead for God's mercy. Where sin abounded, God's grace abounded more. Friend, God wants nothing more from you and to offer you the mercy and grace that He purchased on the cross through the death of His Son. Don't worry about making your life better. Worry about this, that God offers you forgiveness. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes, not whoever can make his life better, not whoever can go through reformation, Whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. Friend, that life can be yours this morning through what Jesus has done. We pray, Father, that You will see us and work in our hearts to help us see, as You do, who we are. That We do not deserve anything but justice. But how even here, we can understand that it is of your mercies that we are not consumed, that we are not bearing those consequences right now for who we are and what we have done. You have given us, just like you gave to Cain, delayed justice, an opportunity for repentance. As the author of Hebrews tells us, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. We can find forgiveness that you have promised. We can find it in Jesus Christ. So Lord, thank you for those even here today who have made that step of faith, who have placed their faith and trust in you. And we acknowledge even now how hard it can be not to just accept the gospel, but to live consistently with it. To know that you are a God of love, mercy, and forgiveness. But like the situation that Corey Ten Boom was faced with, it feels hard sometimes to look at people with those same kinds of eyes, to look at people who have wronged us and to realize they need the forgiveness that you've empowered us to give, to look at our friends and neighbors, some who actively oppose themselves to God and live in outward rebellion and scorn and contempt for you and your ways, and yet we're supposed to love our neighbors as ourselves. Father, we acknowledge that our difficulty. We acknowledge our hesitancy and reluctance. And we ask there for your forgiveness. Help us to see our brothers and sisters out in the world who also need love and forgiveness. And remember that the only way they're ever going to see that hope is through us, through Jesus' presence in our lives, through the words that we speak that offer them reconciliation, peace with God, through Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to get beyond our own anger, resentment, bitterness, prejudices, and see people for what they are, really how you see them, not just as sinners, but sinners who need salvation, sinners whom you loved and sent your only son to die for. We pray this in Jesus' name.